It gives me great pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Bilal Hamid. He's an associate professor uh, of medicine at UCSF and the director of the transplant hepatology program, uh, fellowship program at UCSF, as well as the associate clinic chief of hepatology. And he will be talking to us about drug development in PSC. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ricky and Chris, for inviting me and giving me the, I think, the hardest topic. Uh, I think that's what happened when you're coming for the first time, right? You get that. Um, so um, I'm a student of PSC. I'm learning from the experts. So Marion, Peter, Chris, and we all working in such an interesting field. When I was a fellow, I was at University of Minnesota when the study just came out of high-dose ursodiol. And, I was, as a fellow, responsibility to call patient to stop the ursodiol, and the other end was interesting discussions always. And then uh, at UCSF, as a transplant, I had a lot of patients who we were seeing a lot of, ex at the end of it, getting liver transplantation. I had so many patients in the audience who had transplant and also, at the end, waiting for transplant. So that's my interest in the clinical research that we need medications and where we are. So Chris had an excellent introduction, and part of those introduction will kind of help us understand this topic. And, and I'm coming here, my daughter just told me, Daddy, be on time because I'm always late, so please correct me if I'm coming, going late. So this is my disclosures. Um, I do mostly uh, clinical research, and my two areas of interest are fatty liver disease and PSC. Both don't have any treatment, so that is both the, uh, and some of the medications we are using has the same pathways, and so we will be talking about it. The outline of my talk is, we'll talk about what the drug development process in a few slides, which uh, Chris has mentioned a little bit, Defining the endpoints, because this is the most important thing when we do a study, what endpoints we should be looking at it and what improvement we need. What are the potential targets for new therapies and some of the emerging therapies? We won't have time to talk about everything because there's so many new medications. This is what I think which are more uh, upcoming and which are what I believe, but in question and answer session, if you have any particular question about specific medication, we can talk about. So this is from the FDA. The drug development process is very complicated, and it started from animal model. When we're gonna talk about it, it started from the basic science, uh, what we call bench to bedside. It takes long period of time. And then it takes about one to three years on average that you have medication that you're using it in animal models, then you apply for a license for an FDA so you can use in humans. And it goes from different phases. And you may heard about most of these things. The first is phase one, which they look at whether this medication is safe. So they use healthy volunteer. It can be anywhere between 20 to 80. And then you go into the phase two clinical trial. And the goal of the phase two is emphasis effectiveness and also the safety thing that you know whether this medication is effective and also how safe it is. And it can be around 100 patients or so. And then they go into the bigger, about phase three. Depending on what disease you have, the rare disease, they may need 300 patients, but there are diseases in cardiology and hepatitis that they require thousands of patients. And this process is long. It can take up to two to 10 years. So by the time we have a medication from Penge, it can take up to 10 years. And the medications which I'll be talking about in phase two have been there in animal models and other things for five or six years. So this is a long process. And luckily, we are in the right place because so many new biotech companies are in Bay Area and it's like very lucky to work with them. And there's so much work is going on in this field, which is very impressive. So most of you know, and we don't have, there is no established medical therapy except for liver transplantation. This is a list of, not a, even a complete list. These are the medications which has been studied, showed ineffective, or had side effects. And there's so many different medications out there, then you say, you know what, nothing has been working. And then, you know, and that is where a lot of concept came in. The pathogenesis becomes so important to understand where to start the medication from. But when you look at the role of ursodiol, I know that there's also talk already, just to think about it, that you know, when we have low dose ursodiol, it improved the biochemistry, but there was no change in survival. The median dose, which was 17 to 23 milligram per kilogram per day, did improve the biochemistries, and they were trend about the survival, but these were underpowered studies. 
And we all know about the high dose ursodiol that increased the rate of treatment failure. So, but we learned so much about this trial to understand how to think for the future for the new clinical trial. So the first question comes in whether alkaline phosphatase has a prognostic value, because a lot of studies we will be looking at it talk about that there is an improvement in alkaline. There's much more data in primary biliary cholangitis or PPC about the alkaline phosphatase. But there are studies that have shown, and I think uh, Veronica did mention about that, you know, what is the definition of alkaline phosphatase in clinical trial? Whether it has to be complete normalization, whether there has to be improvement of greater than less than 1.6 or 40% improvement from the baseline. And all these studies have used different, uh, different criteria. So we have to be very cautious going forward that how the companies will design and what is the endpoint which will be, we will be using. So these are the summary of some of these major trials on using alkaline phosphatase. But what we found out from most of these studies that improvement in alkaline phosphate and somehow did had improvement in survival or improvement in clinical, uh, preventing them from clinical decompensation. Therefore, this is an indirect marker that we use in the clinical trial. And so there is still a role of alkaline phosphatase that we have to see. But we do need better biomarkers to understand this disease so that when we do the future trial, we can use how to predict the response and FDA will be requiring it in the future with the new trials. So when we talk about the endpoints for any liver disease or any condition, the first thing is whether we need to improve the histology, whether the liver marker on the biopsy. But anytime when we do the biopsy studies, it's an invasive procedure. I'll show one of the clinical trials which use the, but if you wanted to show improvement in fibrosis, we do have non-invasive imaging, but histology still have a big role. And then we have labs. We already talked about alkaline phosphatase. There are companies who like to use bile acids. The marker of fibrosis, and there's a lot of interest in new markers of fibrosis that we are doing, and we have to have new biomarker. And there are like patient outcomes and also PSC Mayo risk score. And when we study patients who have cirrhosis advance, whether we have to see whether these patients will progress, whether they require liver transplantation or they had worsening or decompensation. So this is where we are, that how we define any clinical trial, which endpoint to use. So it's still a lot of work that have been going on with that. So I showed a lot that, you know, there is no medication, but there is light at the end of the tunnel now. And there is so much new medication, which I'm gonna start talking about one by one. So when we look at the potential pathogenesis and target for PSC, and Chris did talk about, but there are four pathways or which we think right now are working on it. And the most important, which will be the backbone of any future treatment is this bile acid modification called toxic bile hypothesis. And there are, and ursodiol is part of it, and we'll talk about. The next is this intestinal microbiome modification, which we call leaky gut hypothesis. And this is the reason we try to use antibiotics for this, that whether this is the mechanism that patients are getting primary sclerosing cholangitis. The fourth pathway that we all in any liver disease is whether we can modulate liver fibrogenesis, which is scarring of the liver, whether we can improve that, and what medications are working on it that we can use. And lastly is this aberrant gut lymphocyte hypothesis, basically you have colitis and there is something going on part of it and whether we can use some immunomodulator to help with the, also the treatment or work on the improvement of primary sclerosing cholangitis. So if you look at the medications in this bile acid modification, and this is ursodiol, nor urso, we talk about obeta-colic acid, and this is a very interesting uh, part of it called FXR agonist, which I'll kind of try to explain it, simplify it in the, uh, when we talk about these agents. Fibrates are also very interesting, and they are inhibitors. And then we have, uh, these are some of the antifibrotic agents, but there are more. Obeda-colic acid has effect of on fibrosis, which we know from uh, fatty liver disease studies also. We have antibiotic and uh, fecal transplant as part of this, like, you know, same process that whether we can use that. 
And we talk about this apparent gun hypothesis. We know that there are certain uh, agents, like vitaluzumab was taught to uh, work on it, and we'll talk about that this may not, uh, this is not actually uh, that useful in patients with PSC. And there's a new compound called PDD1023. This is in the clinical trial. So this is the framework which we have to think about when the new studies, so there are four pathways, and we will talk about one by one, um, and then see which are the medications which I think are more likely to be more upcoming. And uh, this is a slide which I got from Dr. Troner, and this is a little bit complicated, but it gives you a, in a different way an idea that what are the therapeutic strategies in PSC currently in the clinical trial and overview. We know that you have small duct PSC and you have large duct, but the fibrosis is going on in the bowel duct, right? Then you have liver specific going on in the bowel duct, and then there is a gut, and then that's why people have, you know, have association of colitis. This FXR uh, lichen is actually a one thing that is becoming very popular, and this actually you know, affect on the bile, uh, bile acids and bile synthesis and a lot of other factors improving also uh, uh, the fibrogenesis. And this is, a lot of agents are working on this FXR and there are a lot of new potential agents that we are looking into it. Same with the fibrates work because there is this PPR, peroximal peroxidized receptors, and these agents were like, you know, look, started looking at fibrate, were using it hyperlipidemia, but now there are different kind of it, like vesafibrate, that they has a potential role because of the same reason that the effect on the bowel ducts. Then you have these antibiotics, again, which working on the microbiota or dysbiosis. Then the gut, we have these uh, receptors called MedCam receptor or NTVAB receptors, that if you can look at it, it can help with PSC, and that is one of the pathways. And then we talk about the fibrinogenesis or fibrosis. There are this medication, CVC or Senesiviroric, is actually a chemokine receptor blockade that in fatty liver disease has shown some fibrosis, and there may be some effect in PSC, and there's a small study very few patients, they just finish it and we are waiting for uh, the results of that. And lastly, we'll talk about the Simtuzumab, which has a lot of potential because of the fibrosis. But when you look at the study, it did not work out, but we're gonna go a little bit more deeper into this clinical trial. And then not also diol, uh, it's also, uh, which I think is the closest, uh, and is also the pathways that's working on the bile acids, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's talk about, first of all, is our first uh, you know, pathogenesis pathways and antibiotic. And I know that uh, there's a discussion about vancomycin, and I'm glad that I was not part of that because there's a lot of controversy. But uh, what about the antibiotic and primary sclerosis and cholangitis, right? The biochemical improvement is there, but we don't know the long-term safety and what is the long-term efficacy of it. Most of the clinical trials were done short, right? So whether we can use this medication for how long, and in our cirrhosis patient, we know that when we use antibiotic for prevention of infection, we do worry about resistance also, so this is also part of it. What kind of an antibiotic, whether we use a systemic antibiotic or an antibiotic which is not absorbed and go directly into your colon? The medications ha which has been used are metronidazole, tetracycline, and minocycline, had some effect, but there were a lot of side effects when they were using it. So vancomycin was very promising, in, especially in kids, but there were also data on adult. And so far, the data on probiotics is disappointed, uh, disappointing, but there may be some role. And then the very interesting is fecal transplant. We know about Clostridium difficult or C. diff, it has been successful, whether there is a role of fecal transplant in some of the patients. So that is very interesting. This slide, I. Uh, borrowed it from Dr. Levy, just shows some of the trial. I know it's a busy trial about the antibiotics. And we can know that you know, the trial durations were about like anywhere between 12 months to 54 months, but it did show improvement in alkaline phosphatase. 
And then as I mentioned that some of these medications like minocycline and metronidazole had improvement but at the same time had side effects and people did discontinue the medication because of side effects. So vancomycin is, has the more potential and we have to learn more about it in a longer term study. Uh, rifaximin, which has it's a non-absorbable antibiotic which has been used in patients with cirrhosis for hepatic encephalopathy and their other indication uh, for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth was used uh, uh, in uh, the Dr. Pibian study and did not have any change in alkaline phosphatase, so did not show that it was any beneficial. But whether there can be some role in the future, we have to think about. So right now, we don't have enough data about antibiotics, but vancomycin still seem more promising, but we need to do much bigger studies to understand in the longer studies. So bile acid modification is the backbone and will remain the backbone. So let's talk about the bile acid modification a little bit more. Before we talk about the actual medication, we need to learn a little bit about how the bile acid and circulation and function works. So bile acids or primary bile acids are made from cholesterol inside the liver. And these enzymatic processes happen and the liver makes it and it was sent to gallbladder where it get concentrated. And then once you eat, these have been released into the circulation, into the intestine. And then in small intestine, in colon, there are receptors and it, it bring it back into the liver. And this is what we call enterohepatic circulation, meaning that it absorbed from the intestine, goes back into the liver. And ursodiol try to use the tox change the toxic uh, bile acid to a ursodiol, and that is the reason that we use ursodiol. And what the bile acid functions are, it induces the bile flow, it helps with the lipid transport, and also cholesterol elimination. So this is the main function of the bile acid. And there are studies that use also whether you have improvement in bile acid when you give these medications. So this is uh, in more detail about what is the enterohepatic bile acid circulation looks like. And we talked about some of these receptors already. The FXR receptors are in the liver, they are in the intestine, and also they have a lot of different roles. And they are, uh, other ASPT inhibitor, which I'm going to talk a little bit about it, that is used to help with the absorption of bile acid from the colon. And therefore, people are using these inhibitors that, you know, if you don't um, absorb it again, you may prevent primary or prevent the progression of primary uh, sclerosing cholangitis. So FXR agonist is that's how it works in different mechanism. And non-ursodiol is a very interesting medication because unlike ursodiol, which goes into this enterohepatic circulation, non-ursodiol is called cholehepatic shunting. So it doesn't go into the conjugation phase, so it just get absorbed between hepatocyte and cholangiocyte in the bile duct. So this medication has a high concentration, and this is why this medication you know, was very promising, and this is what we call cholehepatic shunting. I know it's a lot of medical terminology, but this is what, when you look at it, this is what they use as it, and this is why the non arsodiol becomes very uh, encouraging, and I'll show you some of the clinical trial findings. So non ursodiol acid, and it's a side chain shortened antibiotic. So they used 161 PSC patients who had increased alkaline phosphatase and only gave for 12 weeks. So this is very important. This was only given for 12 weeks. But clearly, you can see, even at 12 weeks mark, they had three different dosages, 500 milligram, 1,000, and 1,500, about like 39, 40 patients in the group. And there was a 26% increase uh, change in alkaline phosphatase, so meaning that it has improvement in alkaline phosphatase. And if you look at it, this is uh, improvement in GGT level, improvement in alkaline phosphatase. In any trial, when they stop the medication, you can see the increase in alkaline phosphatase right that happened. So this was definitely helping with the medication, the alkaline phosphatase start increasing. And the important thing is there was a very good safety profile. That's the other important thing. Whenever we 
see any medication, whether this medication doesn't have significant side effect. We'll talk about opetacolic acid and the side effect that that medication had. So this was very well tolerated. And in, in Europe, this is undergoing a phase three clinical trial called NUC5. It's a long-term 96-week treatment uh, trial, which they're looking at biochemical, histological, and endpoint. And the goal is to get 300 patients. So this would be, look out for this. It's still gonna take a few years to complete, but this is the more far ahead the clinical trial that is. So not orthodiol is the one. The other trial which we're gonna talk about a little bit is the opetacolic acid, or what we call FXR agonist. And this is the uh, uh, 76 patient called ASOP trial, and we'll show the data, we already have it. Uh, the GS9674, it's an FXR agonist uh, from uh, Gilead. And this is also a very interesting compound and they have a 12-week study that they have a three arm, like placebo and two different medication uh, arm. And uh, the, uh, the trial, they have early results of the 12-week study, and hopefully they will uh, kind of present in the liver meeting. Uh, and then this, they will have an open label phase of 96 weeks. So that would be very important that every patient will get the medication uh, for 96 weeks, and we will have the results hopefully in the future. Uh, there's another compound called NGM-282, uh, which was just, uh, they did a late breaker abstract at EASL about this compound, which had improvement in, uh, you know, the result outcome they were looking at, whether they can improve the alkaline phosphate, and I'll show you some data. And the lastly, there is a compound which we were talking about, this inhibitor called ASPT, which is actually a receptor that, you know, if you inhibit that, it blocks the absorption of bile acid, and there was a compound LUM001. Uh, it was very safe, and, but the problem was that in 27 patients, there was no improvement in alkaline phosphatase. So we have to see whether there has any role going forward in the future. So I kept talking about this FXR, and the first agent that came out in the market was obetacolic acid, which has been approved a couple of years back for primary biliary cholangitis. There's a lot of data uh, also in fatty liver disease in NASH, and they're doing a big phase three clinical trial. But it works in a lot of different pathways. It activates the fatty acid, it shut down the bile acid synthesis, and also work in the gut, and then improve uh, the meat, uh, insulin sensitivity. So it works in very different pathways. Therefore, they also studied in fatty liver disease and other uh, choly uh, cholestatic liver disease like PBC and PSC. So this was the trial which they presented last year at a liver meeting called ASOP trial. It was a randomized double-blind placebo trial. Again, they had 77 patients. It was a placebo arm. There was a 1.5 milligram and five milligram. They had a low dose and after 12 weeks, they increased the dose to three milligram and then 10 milligram. So the data which I'm gonna show is more about 12 weeks and then there's a long-term study for, uh, it's still ongoing. So it did have a significant improvement in reduction of serum alkaline phosphatase within 24 weeks as compared to placebo. And the effect occurred in those dependent patients and regardless whether they were on ursodiol or not. So this definitely they had looked at it, even if you are on ursodiol, the response was there. But one thing was happened is that they had patients who in a higher dose had very severe pruritus. And this is the thing we also saw in patients with fatty liver disease, so pruritus is one of those side effects of it. But we do need further investigation, and there is an ongoing two-year study that we will have more results of it. In our fatty liver uh, study that we did, we, we saw that there was also an increase in LDL and total cholesterol in patients, but we will find out in our phase three clinical trial in fatty liver also whether that is true, because FXR, uh, has some effect in the cholesterol metabolism also, so we will kind of find out. So NGM-282 is the latest medication which was presented at EASL. It's a non-tumorogenic FGF19 analog that also regulate bile acid homeostasis. So they had 62 patients with elevated alkaline phosphatase of greater than 1.5, upper limit of normal. They had three, uh, one milligram, three milligram in the placebo, but the, this has 
subcutaneous injection for 12 weeks. So that's the other thing that you know how they are. And there is data also in fatty liver disease, the same medication which shows that they have improvement in fatty liver. The outcome was change in alkaline phosphatase from baseline to week 12. So if you look at it, there was no change in alkaline phosphatase at week 12. But interestingly, they had improvement in ALP and ASD, and serum bile acid would significantly decrease, and some of the marker of inflammation and fibrosis were better. So despite that the primary outcome was improvement in alkaline phosphatase, which they did not reach, they were trend towards that some of the indirect factors of improving the bile acid as well as the biomarker inflammation, so they had some potential. So at 12 weeks, the alkaline phosphatase was not significantly reduced. It does inhibit bile acid synthesis, and it does decrease the marker of inflammation and improve marker of fibrosis. So uh, we will talk about, I know this, uh, people, a lot of my patients do ask me about where to lose a map. I know they're expert in IBD, but uh, their experience from retrospective and series and registries are discouraging. Early on, there were some, but the latest one was this GET8 multicenter cohort study. They have 56 patients with IBD on this, 22 centers from France and Belgium. They did not see any difference in the liver enzyme between week 30 and 24. And actually, there were patients who had increase in alkaline phosphatase. And there were also 21 person had at worst of event, meaning they have infection and other things on it. And uh, they were conducting the phase three clinical trial, but this was withdrawn. The goal was to have more than 270 patients. So, so far, this is not vitalizumab. What we believe is right now we don't have enough data, and the studies have not showed any uh, encouraging result that has improved the liver enzyme. But there are a lot of other compounds, as we talked about, anti-WAP agent like PDD1023, that may have some roles, because this is the pathogenesis that we have to look out. So th but this is not that far along as our bile acid modification theory. Lastly is this modulators of liver fibrogenesis. So I talked about a lot of you know, these uh, trials, but the one I want to talk about is this simtuzumab because this is a very well done study, and the thought was this: there is a marker of fibrosis in the serum and tissue called LOX2, which are elevated in patients with PSC and then can correlate with fibrosis stage. Even in the preclinical study, it improved the fibrosis, and it's a an humanized IgG4 monoclonal antibody that's been used. So the, the company, it was a very uh, good compound, and there was a, a, a basic science feature on it they wanted to see. So the, what they, it was a very well done design. They had 75 patients in three different arms. It was 125 milligram subcutaneous Q weekly, and they have uh, 125 one, and 75 and a placebo. So all these patients had liver biopsy and MRCP and also had it at 48 weeks and 96 weeks. And the goal was to look at whether there was any progression of fibrosis or the mainly whether it's safe and at the same time there's any decompensation or worsening of the liver disease. So they wanted to look at the adverse event and the primary outcome was on hepatic collagen when you do the biopsy whether there was any improvement in it or not. So unfortunately this is one of those, you know, story that the company had invested a lot, was very promising. But there was no effect of symptomzumab on hepatic collagen content, no matter whether you use 125 milligram, 75 milligram, or placebo. So it was not statistically significant. The other fibrosis marker was also the same. And then also there was no effect on progression to cirrhosis. So same number of patients, no matter what dose you were, was still progression to cirrhosis. And based on that, this was not uh, considered to be, uh, it was safe, but it was not considered to be useful in the study. And same thing was happening in, uh, in the fatty liver also. So it was a lot of investment, but unfortunately, but it just brings the point that this is a pathway that we are looking, and there are other agents in the same pathway of fibro, uh, fibronogenesis that we are looking not only in PSC, but also in patients with fatty liver disease. So, in my last few slides, so what is the prerequisite for the future success in PSC treatment? And again, this is my opinion. I think it's an earlier diagnosis is the key, but we do need very novel and new diagnostic tools and standard. We have to still understand the pathogenesis more and more. 
The treatment option, we do have a lot of new medication, but as Chris has pointed out, it would be the combination of medication. Hopefully, there will be a future that we can tell that which patient has which pathways. And we have medications from all pathways, and it say that you need more bile acid, you need fibrogenetically, you need uh, antibiotics. So that would be the future of fatty liver disease and patient with PSC. What is the role of microbiome and fecal transplant? And again, since it's a drug, they're still like endoscopic. There is a clinical trials going up about standing and balloon dilatation and transplant, and still we need to understand all these things even better. And these registries are also will be very helpful going forward. We need to understand the clinical trials endpoint, whether it's lab imaging, biomarker, and histology. And at the same time, the study group are the most, the international PSC group, the CALID, and these are very, very important for us to understand what are the patients? Because there are not every patient will need treatment. There will be early stage versus, and which patients will need more treatment or urgent treatment will be a priority. So in summary, the pathogenesis of PSC is complex, but they're very exciting therapeutic targets and agents. There are many remedies, but no cure yet. But we are going to go there. The near future, I think, is the norosodiol and FXR agonist. The combination therapies likely will be needed. And the personalized medicine may bring more hope uh, to this disease and hopefully other diseases. Thank you, everyone.